Dennis Nilsson is one of Britain's most notorious and prolific mass murderers. He was taking us into really a world of evil. Known as Des, Nilsson strangled, drowned and butchered 15 young men, keeping their bodies around his flat until he chose to burn or boil the gory remains. Nielsen was somebody who became addicted to murder. Within hours, what seemed just another inquiry developed into one of the biggest mass murder inquiries ever conducted in Britain. There was this cold water all around me, and what it actually tried to do was drown me. All I wanted to say to him was, do you know what you've done? Only a few survived Nielsen's brutal attacks, but to this day, he dominates their lives. It ruined my life from that moment onwards. Sometimes it seems really, really unbearable, and I wish he'd just left me for dead. February 1983, Detective Chief Inspector Peter Jay got a phone call. A drain in the smart suburb of Muswell Hill was blocked with what appeared to be human remains. I remember with our scenes of crime officer taking possession of three little pieces of flesh uh, and, and three small bones. The bones had a knuckle at each end and they seemed to be about two and a half inches long and it looked as if they'd come from a human hand. The gruesome discovery was taken to Hammersmith Hospital and examined by the pathologist who confirmed the police had a murder on their hands. He said to me, you're right. He said, it is human, but I can tell you that your victim's been strangled. And I remember saying to him with a smile on my face, come on, Prof, you've been watching too much television. And he said, no, he said, look at this. He said, you brought me by pure chance a piece from a neck, and there's a clear ligature mark on it. In April 1982, Carl Stotter, a vulnerable 21-year-old, had moved from Blackpool to a hostel in North London. He was trying to start a new life after running away from a violent boyfriend. Carl went to a local gay pub where Nilsson, who'd already brutally murdered 13 men, was out drinking. Nilsson was sort of like talking at the bar to this other guy and the other guy left and then he came over and introduced himself and asked if he could sit down and, and just generally started a, a, a normal conversation. He seemed intelligent, caring. He seemed like a nice guy. I told him about my ex-partner, and um, he thought it was um, terrible that somebody should do that to somebody. There was an attraction there, um, but maybe that was because, you know, he was just being nice to me and, you know... I needed comforting, and that was the only reason why we sort of like went back in the first place, really. It wasn't for anything else other than just to chat and become friends kind of thing. Carl and Nilsson took a cab to 23 Cranley Gardens, where one man's dismembered and decomposing remains were concealed in bin liners around the flat. It seemed like an old house. A smell in the house, uh, which I put down to sort of like age. Um, he said he had a dog, so I thought maybe, you know, doggy smells, dog food, maybe some dog food had gone off or something. Um, but it wasn't sort of like anything that really sort of like bothered me at the time. Sometimes you'd be like you, 
or in quite large Bacardis, and I wasn't really a great drinker at that time. We listened to some music through the headphones. I wasn't expecting him to be so close behind me. After getting him drunk, Nelson put Carl to bed. He um, warned me about getting into bed, but he had like a, a sleeping bag that was opened up like a duvet. And he said that I might get caught up in it. I woke up with a sleeping bag zip around my neck. It was really it's like digging into my neck, tearing into my neck. As I put my hands up, at first I thought Nelson was trying to help me out of the zip. Um, and I think before I fell unconscious, I realised he was pulling tighter. The next thing I remember is being immersed in in um, cold water, um, which was when he tried to um, uh, drown me. I managed to pull myself out of the bath on three occasions, but I was too weak and exhausted, and he just pushed me back under. And I remember just lying there and thinking that, that this man is killing you and you're dying. Nelson lifted Carl's lifeless body from the bath and lay it on the sofa. It was only when his dog started licking Carl's face that Nelson realised his victim was still alive. Having already murdered 13 men, Nelson then incredibly decided to revive Carl. Nelson brought Carl back from the brink of death with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, and he had an explanation ready. I realised there was something wrong, but I had no memory of what had happened, and I told Nelson that I would need to get to hospital, there was something wrong. He said I got caught up in the sleeping bag zip. I said, there's water. He said, well, I put you in cold water because you were in shock. And I thought, well, you don't do that to people in shock, but I thought maybe he didn't know that. Nelson offered to walk Carl to Camden Tube, which he said was five minutes away. Instead, they walked almost seven miles, cutting through Highgate Woods, where Carl now believes Nelson intended to finish him off. So it's a shortcut. I'm an ex-dancer. I don't stumble or trip over or anything like that. And I hit the ground really hard, and Nelson yanked me up. And as my head threw back, I saw a man walking his dog, and this man had stopped and was sort of like staring. It was very unnerving. And I did think at that point that there was something wrong, but no memory. He left me outside Camden Tube Station. I got straight on the tube. But Nelson wasn't prepared to let go completely. We arranged to meet the following week, but I wasn't really paying much attention. It's not that I didn't have any intentions of not meeting him again. I was concentrating more on getting to the hospital. Carl went to the hospital, believing Nilsson's story that he'd got caught up in the sleeping bag zip. 
the doctor turned around and he said, well, I, th I think somebody's trying to kill you. And I mean, the thing is, you know, <laughs> somebody's going to try and kill you. They're not going to let you walk out of their house. And that, that makes sense, doesn't it? And, you know, I thought, well, what is this doctor on? Really, I wanted to just go home and, and rest, which is what I did do. I think I must have slept for about a week afterwards. And it all became faded. It's very common in victims of trauma that they can't remember a very salient or important part of the attack that's being made against them, maybe because it's actually too psychologically distressing for them to recall it. Carl felt no need to go to the police. Nilsson went on to kill again. But there was another man who inexplicably survived Dennis Nilsson. He was good fun to be around. You know, we, if we went to a bar or a club, he was a great laugh. May 1979. Four years before he'd tried to murder Carl Stotter, Dennis Nelson, a former army cook and probationary police officer, was working in a job centre in Soho. He'd positioned himself perfectly to meet young men. Martin Hunter Craig was one of them. Leading a nomadic life, the streetwise 19-year-old was drifting in and out of jobs and other people's beds when he met a man calling himself Des in London's West End. I am a DJ. I am I first met Des back in 1979 in the amusement arcade in Nesta Square. I was playing on one of the machines uh, and Des was watching the machine too. His first words were, you won't get much out of that. We went to a pub called the Golden Lion in Nesta Square. He said, I'm, I'm hungry, do you want to go for a pizza? And from there, I went to Apple. He said, you know, he bought me a drink. I said, well, I really haven't really got the money to pay for pizzas and drink. You know, he said, no, 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 it's on me. And he said, do you want to come back for coffee? Martin agreed to go home with the 33-year-old, unaware Nilsson had recently murdered his first victim. I did actually say to him, are you gay? But he never gave me an answer to that. He just said, um, well, there you go, we'll see. Like that. And I thought, all right then, well, all right then. So I went back home to, to Melrose Avenue. After spending the night together, despite the age gap, the pair began a casual affair that would last the remainder of Nilsson's murderous career. Martin hadn't a clue what was really going on. He was good fun to be around. You know, if we went to a bar or a club, he was a great laugh. I found him really... I looked up to him, a bit like an older brother. I knew I couldn't love him, but I was quite fond of him. I could sleep with him, but nothing more than that. During the next two years at Melrose Avenue, Nilsson's lust for murder would escalate rapidly. Eleven more men would die violently in the rooms on that quiet suburban street. Dennis Nilsson was somebody who became addicted to, to murder. I think the most he had under the floor at any one time was six uh, at Melrose Avenue. Um, I remember him saying once that he couldn't get much more underneath the floorboards and he decided that he would have to have a fire in his garden. He set up a funeral pyre in the back garden. Using rubber tires to disguise the smell of the burning bodies.
Martin regularly stayed with Nelson when he came to London, but he only occasionally got a hint of his friend's darker side. One of the things he did used to do was play dead. He would um, literally collapse into a heap on the floor with his arms open, a bit like Jesus on the cross, really. I couldn't understand why, because I knew that he wasn't unconscious. There was one occasion when, because the door was slightly open, the dog ran out and down the stairs. Within a few seconds, Des was up chasing that dog and bringing him back up the stairs. I can't understand what he expected me to do. Was it, you know, to take advantage of him, etc.? I don't know, but that's not really my scene. Martin and Dennis's relationship was probably very important to Dennis because he had somebody who was willing to tolerate or even play along with his sexual fantasies. There may be another reason why Martin never became a victim. Whenever he said anything to me, which was a little bit high class is rude, I would come back with one line and I would immediately just put him back, put him in his place. And, but he seemed to like that. He seemed to like this idea of being controlled in some way. I don't know why, but that's what he seemed to like. It seems to me that Martin falls into a very different category to Dennis's victims. Dennis had an ongoing relationship with Martin. He knew that Martin would come back to him. Martin essentially was his only friend. All by myself in the morning and I'm all by myself in the night. Although Martin sometimes questioned his friend's behavior, it didn't seriously worry him. I always thought there was a lot more to Des than I knew about, but because I didn't live with him properly as a partner, I didn't really feel I had the right to, to ask him too many questions. And even if I had, I don't think he would have given me all the answers. Des is a very secretive person, and he wouldn't have told me too much. Um, but that's what I liked about him, mystical. I like people like that. In October 1981, Nilsson moved out of Melrose Avenue. But before he left, he burned the remaining bodies and removed all traces of the 12 men he'd butchered there in one last bonfire. Nilsson then moved to 23 Cranley Gardens, where he would go on to try and murder Carl Stotter. All by myself. It's quite possible that he saw this as an opportunity to break this cycle of addiction and killing. I know that there was nowhere for him to store bodies at Cranley Gardens. I'm sure that he was acutely aware of this too. Dennis also asked Martin to move in with him. I didn't mind an on-off relationship, but I didn't want to settle down with Des. It wasn't... I couldn't put up with the drinking and the, the silliness when he was drunk. It just gets on my nerves when anybody's out of their brains with drink. Had Martin moved in, I doubt that the relationship would have succeeded anyway. I doubt that Martin would have been able to meet Dennis's needs for power and control, and I think that it wouldn't have been long before he started to try and meet those needs by killing people. Within months of his move to Cranley Gardens, Nilsson was back on the prowl, and two more men were dead. But without space under the floorboards, he was now struggling to conceal his crimes. When I went to see Des after he'd moved from Melrose Avenue to Cranley Gardens, the first thing I said to him the minute I walked in the door was, that smell, Des, it seems to follow you around. I said, you had it at Melrose Avenue, you've got it here, what is it? Um, that bad, musty smell, and he laughed. And he said, um, that smell follows me everywhere, Skip. 
um, it's in the walls, it's in the floors. And then he just seemed to laugh it off. It was the stench of death, but Martin still had no idea he was surrounded by body parts. If you had smelt that not knowing what it was, you could well have put it down to a mustiness, a deep mustiness, or something rotting, whether it be wood or, or, or whatever. But it was a smell of decomposition. It was the same smell that Carl Stotter had noticed when he had first entered Nilsson's flat on that fateful night in April 1982. Three months after Nilsson had tried to kill him, Carl was still unaware of what had happened until the memories began to resurface. I actually started um, to get flashbacks, which was triggered by, a, I think it was a horror story I was reading, and I just sort of had these like uncontrollable, sort of like um, shaking, and the fear, I, I would never be able to describe that kind of fear. Carl went to his family and then mental health services for help, but he was persuaded that his flashbacks were false memories caused by the abuse he'd suffered at the hands of his ex-boyfriend. He was told that no one had tried to kill him. It was all in his mind. I was put on antidepressants, nerve tablets, which just helped to blot things out even more, really. It's sort of like, I think I've lost about six, eight months of my life just... Sort of like walking around just full of tranquilizers and, and stuff and thinking it was me. During those months, Nilsson had murdered his last two victims. Martin Hunter Craig could have easily become his final kill. In February 1983, only days before Nilsson's bloody crimes were uncovered, Martin went to 23 Cranley Gardens. He interrupted his friend and lover, trying to dispose of his last victim. The last time I went to see Des was the Sunday, the two days before he was arrested. I went up the stairs and knocked on his private flat door. I knew he was in there. It took two minutes for him to answer the door. And he seemed flustered and quite upset that I was there, which is unusual for Des because he always was very welcoming, I found. He said, you can't come in, Skip, you can't come in. He said, I'm too busy, I've, everything's all gone wrong to do. That moment, the dog crept through his legs and ran down the stairs. So Des then said, just mind the door and ran down the stairs, all the way down to the bottom. And I was there holding the door so that it wouldn't lock on him and um, waited for him to come up. It's a great relief that I didn't open the door. I think if I'd seen something in that flat that day, it would have acted quite quickly to cover his tracks and it would have probably hurt me. Four days later, Detective Chief Inspector Peter Jay was called to the house. A plumber had found human body parts blocking a drain. They had come from a pipe that began halfway up the building. There was no one living in the middle flat, so I knew straight away that it must have come from higher up in the house where there was just one person living, a chap called Dennis Nielsen. The chief inspector and his colleagues waited for Nelson to arrive home. And as he came in, um, I remember looking at him straight in the eyes. And I said to him, I'm Detective Chief Inspector Jay from Hornsey Police Station. I've come about your drains. And a little smile came onto his face and he said, since when have police been interested in blocked drains? And I said, well, you take me up in your flat and I'll tell you all about it. And having got inside the flat, we could smell decomposing flesh. And 
I said to him, your drains are blocked with human remains. And he said, oh my God, how awful. And just for that one moment, I thought he was going to be a little bit difficult. And I got a little bit closer to him and I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, don't mess about, where's the rest of the body? And he said, fair enough, it's in two plastic bags in the wardrobe in the other room. As soon as you opened the door, the smell intensified and I closed it straight away and I said, we'll deal with that later. When we arrested Nielsen at Cranley Gardens, there were actually the remains of three bodies there. One had been dead a week, uh, one nine months, and the other 18 months. So two of them were in a bad state of decomposition, but most of the flesh had been taken from the bones because what he was doing was stripping the flesh from the bones, flushing it down the toilet, and then, on some occasions, putting the bones out for the dustman. After his arrest, Nilsson cooperated fully with the police, and during three weeks of questioning, the full horror of his crimes emerged. The interviews that we carried out with Nielsen were bizarre. What he was telling us was, well, he was taking us into really a world of evil. Mass murder in London. Police search for up to 16 dismembered bodies. The media soon got wind of the story. They'd said that somebody had been arrested at Muswell Hill. And when they described what had happened, and then they showed the street, Cranley Gardens, I knew then that it was Des. That mystery, that little thing that was there about him, that he was hiding from me, had finally been exposed. A person I'd I classed for the last three years, who was a mate, has been arrested for murder and there's body parts all over the house. It took me a good couple of hours to actually sit down and think, what the hell is going on here? A pathologist confirmed that human remains found in a sewer outlet were parts of three bodies. A further four charges of murder and two of attempted murder have been brought against Nielsen. Police looking for human remains in West London have begun a detailed search of a house in Melrose Avenue. The search for a possible 13 bodies continues. By the time Nielsen was arrested, Martin Hunter Craig had known him for four years during a period in which he had killed 14 young men and attempted to murder seven others. The media flooded into London's hostels, shelters and gay venues in search of young men who'd first-hand experience of Nilsson and his so-called House of Horrors. David Chater, who was working for ITN News at 10, at the time was just interviewing people about what they thought about the situation regarding Des, and he happened to speak to me. And then we went to Muswell Hill, and um, he said I could sleep there and um, have food there the next day until he found us somewhere. As soon as I got the interview over with David on News at 10, my life did seem to change from that moment on. Things just weren't the same no more. Martin had survived Nilsson, but now became a victim of a savage press, who in 1983 still viewed homosexuality as taboo. It was quite traumatic being hated by the press. Things were a lot different from what they are now. People are more open, people are more, you know, uh, tolerant to gay people, etc., etc. But back then they weren't. My family were quite private and really didn't want too many people knowing about me being gay. There were a lot of people working for newspapers who were racist, sexist, prejudiced in one way or another, and it very often emerged in conversation. And certainly with Nielsen, it was made very clear to me that he deserved all he got, and his victims, if they were just a load of gay rent boys, they deserved what they got as well, which is pretty abhorrent. And that was 
without question reflected in the way the stories were presented. The attitude of the media at the time was not only hostile, it demonised people like Martin. Uh, victims were seen to be conspirators. As if being outed wasn't enough, the press also implied that given Martin's long-term relationship with Des, he had to be in on the murders. Wherever I seemed to go, people generally assumed, one of few people, that, like I said, you've known this guy for all those years, you can't seriously tell me you don't know nothing about what was going on, you've known him too long. You must do, and I really didn't know a thing about it. Well, I'd have been out the door like a shot. In what the press coverage did was it confirmed society's worst fears about homosexuality. That not only was it something that was wrong, disgusting, as people saw it, unnatural, but that it was linked to other forms of deviancy. Um, in this case, murder. I felt like... I had leprosy, I just felt, you know, people were trying to keep away from me, or else the wrong kind of people wanted to know me. The people that were morbidly fascinated or whatever. And so I didn't know who to trust no more. I had no trust in anybody. I'd lost trust because I did trust Des, and I couldn't trust anybody. And I trusted my mother, but I, she went cold on me, and she, she took that to the grave. She, she died in 2001, and we never really... Got back together again after that. As the press conducted their witch hunt, the murder squad were looking for men who'd survived Nelson's attacks. They found Carl Stotter. One minute you're being told by professional people that it's your imagination, and then the next minute other professional people come along and say, well, no, it's not your imagination, that you didn't imagine it, it did happen. <laughs> When Dennis Nelson was first arrested, he confessed to 15 grisly murders and seven failed attacks. The police were still searching for the men who'd escaped him when they got a tip-off. A man in group therapy was having recurring nightmares about strangulation and drowning. His name was Carl Stotter. We'd been asked to go and see Carl um, because this was a man that was having... Uh, recollections in relation to an attempted murder um, which fitted the situation with Dennis Nielsen and that this could be one of the attempted murder victims. It was quite a shock a year later to find the police sort of like questioning me about this man which had just completely gone into my subconscious. Um, they asked me if I'd ever been to Cranley Gardens, I didn't know where that was. Um, they asked me if I knew anyone called Des or Dennis Nilsson, and no, uh, I couldn't remember. And then the next question they asked me was, wait, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. They just said, okay, then sleeping bag. And everything, it, it was, it all came flood, flooding back. <laughs> This was the person that had been in Dennis Nielsen's flat and actually had been brought back to life by Dennis Nielsen. One minute you're being told by professional people that it's your imagination and then the next minute other professional people come along and say, well, no, it's not your imagination, that you didn't imagine it, it did happen. He just sat there for a while and was blank. Uh, his mouth was open and he just had a sharp intake of breath. Uh, but he was completely phased by it. You know, I just went through shock like a second time. Um, it, it, was, it was awful. Really, you know, it's, you know, I suffered for it the first time and then sort of like the second time. Um, it, was, it was just as bad, just as real, just as frightening. Nilsson could only be charged with six of the 15 murders as the police were unable to identify the other bodies, a challenge that continues to this day. As recently as January 2006, Nilsson identified his very first victim, 14-year-old Stephen Holmes. In 1983, Nilsson was also charged with two attempted murders 
but it was too late to include Carl Stotter's case. However, the prosecution, aware of the impact his testimony would have on a jury, called him as a witness. It's not just a question of giving evidence. It's reliving what happened in the presence of the very man who tried to kill them. On the 25th of October, 1983, Carl Stotter prepared to go to court. My mother said I was looking really, really pale and, um, you know, put a little bit of makeup on just to colour the skin kind of thing. And, I mean, it was so slight, it was unbelievable, but the, the press picked up on that. Um, I was referred to in court as effeminate, pathetic... Um, these are people that know nothing about me or my life or anything. And it took a great deal of strength and courage to, to go to court. He came across as a fairly broken, damaged individual. But I think anyone who'd gone through what he went through is entitled to be damaged. Carl's trauma continued long after he'd left the witness box, now a victim of the hostile attitude towards homosexuality in the early 80s. When I came out of court, um, I think... Somebody shouted out, um, he should have killed you, you queer bastard, basically. Um, somebody else has spat at me. The Nielsen case shows, I think, just how much ignorance can breed fear and indeed hatred because people didn't know much about gay life at the time. It was something that was seen to be clandestine, closeted, um, and in a box. Martin Hunter Craig, Nilsson's close friend of four years, also attended the trial. Martin hadn't seen the man he knew as Des since Nilsson's arrest nine months earlier. Desperate to make sense of the dark, hidden side of his friend, he visited Nilsson in the cells. I seemed to get the funny impression that he was enjoying this, this fame that he got. All I wanted to say to him was, do you know what you've done? Do you really know what you've done? The gravity of all this, you know. But it, it didn't see, it, nothing, nothing seemed to be real to him anymore. He's, he was smiling. He had no conscience. He had no guilt about him. I remember sitting down and for the first time in my life not being able to say nothing for two minutes full stop while he just spoke. How's it going? What's the weather like? The food in here is bloody terrible. And things like, um, I didn't come down to talk about the weather and what the food was like. You know, I'd like to know a little bit about what, why did you do this? Why on earth, what, what's happened? Why did you do this? Why didn't you hurt me? Why, why, why? No one really knows what motivated Nilsson to kill. Some believe his obsession with death started as a child after he viewed the body of his dead grandfather. But there are many other theories. It seems as if he killed the people that he really wanted to stay, the people he'd taken home with him, that he liked. The fact that they wanted to go at midnight, one, two, three in the morning, was the trigger, I think, in many of those cases. Dennis's killings were clearly motivated by his sexual needs, but I feel that these are very much secondary to his emotional needs. This is really a pathetic character. He needs to feel powerful, and it's this feeling of power and having ultimate control over another person which I feel are absolutely central to the killings and to all of the fantasy and the ritual that was built up around the killings. He did say to me once, it's as well you caught me when you did, because if it hadn't have been now with 15 victims, it would have been later with 150. On the 4th of November, 1983, Nilsson was convicted of six counts of murder and two of attempted murder. The jury rejected the argument that he was insane and Nelson was sentenced to life in prison. Twenty-three years on, Carl and Martin continue to live with the horror of the past. I live a completely different life from what I used to. 
quite a, a reclusive life, really. It ruined my life from that moment onwards. I don't always feel lucky that he kept me alive because I have the memory of this to live with me for the rest of my life. Surviving Nilsson was only the beginning of both men's struggle to get their lives back. I don't go out that much, um, and certainly not when it's dark. I could never go to a, a, a nightclub or a pub and allow myself to be invited back to a stranger's place again. It did get to the point where I wouldn't answer the phone, I wouldn't go to the front door, I wouldn't go out. People were calling round to see me, but I didn't want to open the door. Both men turned to alcohol in an attempt to numb the pain. With the drinking, I destroyed my pancreas, ended up in a diabetic coma. Um, and it just seems that I've just sort of like, I I'm dead. I, I feel as if I'm dead. There's no spirit there. There's no hope, no dreams. There's just this constant fear. I found actually some comfort knowing that I could block things out for a while. The only thing is the next morning when the cold light of dawn, it's all back to reality again. It did ease the pain a little bit, it did ease the feeling inside of, of guilt, some kind of thing that I felt guilty over and I hadn't done anything. Close to a breakdown, Martin admitted himself to hospital. They gave you so many drugs, and all sorts of things, you really didn't know what you were doing. In the end, I thought, I've got to get out of this place, and never went back. Eventually, both men took the difficult decision to confront their demons head on. I wrote to Nelson because at the end of the day, there was two people in that room. I didn't get the answers at the trial. I didn't get really anything, but I needed to know for myself. A relationship did kind of develop. I did have strong feelings for him, I mean, because you can't just hate somebody without having loved them, and vice versa. The, the two emotions go hand in hand. Victims often want to understand why they were chosen. They look for something which will allow them to complete the story. But the truth is that perpetrators often choose people for no very important reason. They do not care about the individuals. And so the victim's search for an explanation is eventually fruitless. Basically, they weren't that important. And that is what's so hard for them as they seek to try and find the answers they so desperately need. Um, the letters that I got back, they weren't really all that clear. He was quite vague about me, really. I mean, it's doubtless whether he even really remembered me at all. Martin went to see his old friend in prison. I said to him, if I had have moved in with you in 1980, what would have happened? He said we'd still be living together now, Skip. And he looked quite sad when he said that. And I said, those people wouldn't have died. He said, no. Is that, is all that would have happened. We'd have been living happily ever after. He said yes. The feelings of guilt continue to haunt Martin and Carl to this day. It makes you feel rather strange, you know. Look, there are 15 people out there that have all died. Something I did, they weren't doing. I pride myself on being quite a sensitive person, really, you know. Surely was there something I could have known, you know, or felt or sensed or, or noticed? Um, um, the things that I read afterwards in the papers about, you know, severed heads and feet in, in kitchen cupboards and could I not have opened a cupboard and got a cup or something? Not realising a tea chest in that front room had a torso in it. It does mess around with your head an awful lot. It's tough being gay and terrified of men. I don't know where I go from there. I think I'd just better 
stick with my cat, really, and my home. Des killed those people, but I feel I have in a way. I do feel partly responsible. And I've been accused of it as well. So, there you go. Tomorrow over on Sky One, it's the second part of Ross Kemp's investigation into life in the Middle East. That's at nine. But next over on Sky Movies premiere, Tilda Swinton stars in Julia, a tale of abduction and alienation in L.A.